Welcome to the Startup Competitors Podcast, where we talk with early stage entrepreneurs to understand what information they use to inform product roadmap, strategy, and market differentiation. Hey there, thanks for listening. Today we're sitting down with Jonathan Merrill, who's a practicing pediatrician. He's the director of the Clinical Care Innovation Accelerator, and most importantly, he's the CEO of Compact Medical Solutions. We're going to be talking to him today about Compact Medical Solutions and some of the innovation they're doing on the BVM. And if, like me, you didn't know what a BVM is, you will learn that on the other side of this podcast. Subscribe, leave us a review, all of the things. You know what we need you to do to help get the word out. Thank you so much for listening and enjoy the episode. This episode is brought to you by Full Stack PEO. Most founders start companies because they figured out a better way to solve a problem or serve a need, not because they love tracking payroll, filling out compliance forms, and explaining employee benefits packages. And yet, all that stuff still has to be done. That's why there's Full Stack PEO. Full Stack PEO specializes in turnkey HR for emerging companies, not just those core services, but advice and expertise that help founders maximize employee potential. Curious? Find out more at fullstackpeo.com. Welcome to the show. Today we have Jonathan Merrill, who's the founder and CEO of Compact Medical Solutions. Jonathan, welcome. Thank you. I appreciate you giving me the chance to, to be on your program. Why don't we start with a quick overview and pitch for Compact Medical Solutions? Sure. Uh, We are working to make sure that when somebody does CPR uh, to save your life, that they do it the right way. And in summary, uh, Compact Medical Solutions is a medical device startup here in Indianapolis, Indiana, and we are designing uh, a new type of bag valve mask resuscitator called the Butterfly BVM. And let's say I don't know what a bag valve mask resuscitator is. Can you just give me a a brief overview of that? Yeah, sure. So uh, a bag valve mask is a device used to help somebody breathe when they can't breathe on their own. You've seen this on on TV shows. They put a mask over a patient's face, you squeeze a bag, and uh, it it helps to blow air into the lungs and, uh, and help them to breathe. And so we are working on a new one, a new type of bag valve mask we call the Butterfly BVM, which we are designing to be the slimmest and hopefully someday the safest bag valve mask resuscitator. And then just really quick before we jump into the Q&A, current status, anything you can share that would paint a picture of where the company is on its journey to uh, either, you know, launching, traction, scaling, whatever that is. Yeah. So we are pre-revenue, but we have made a, a, a tremendous amount of progress, particularly in the last year. Uh, so last, I'd say April of 2019, we had a prototype and, uh, and not much else. Uh, in, in the last year, we've made a tremendous amount of progress. Uh, we are a more lean company now. We've been able to secure some additional investments. We went through the G-Beta Accelerator, uh, which is just a fantastic experience uh, here in Indianapolis. And that has really helped us to sharpen our skills and uh, and figure out how to pitch and and, and get in front of uh, investors. And we are making a lot of progress on the fundraising front. We, you know, about six months ago, we really didn't have any, I'd say, any institutional investors that were interested in talking to us. And now we're we're in varying levels of of discussions with with about a half dozen of them. And actually, just this last week, we pitched to two different angel groups in New York City. Both of those pitches were very well received, and we are on to the next round of discovery with both of those groups, uh, which uh, which is just super exciting for us. Congrats. That's awesome. Thank you. And I, I'm assuming those were remote pitches? Yeah. Yeah, they were they were remote pitches. Uh, yeah. I, I, I don't even know if you can drive into New York City right now with uh, COVID. <laughs> I'm not sure if that's even an option. And uh, no, so those, those were were remote pitches, which was uh, which was interesting. It was it was, uh, it was but you know what? It, it worked just fine. Um, I, I like being live and, and in front of uh, an audience much better. Uh, I, I kind of I love pitching and I love kind of feeling the energy in, in, in the crowd and, and all that. So there, it wasn't quite as thrilling as being there in person, but um, but I, I think it still it still got the message across. And like I said, it was very well received, and we've got uh, a 
I was just told that there's um, 18, one of those groups, there's 18 of the investors who were there who want to be part of our discovery call, which is which is beyond what we what we would have hoped for uh, walking into it. So I, I think it all went well, worked out, even though it was virtual. That's awesome. Congratulations. Thank you. Let's back up, up maybe a little bit. Why a butterfly BVM? What got you here? Why did you want to start this business? Yeah. So the, the company started out of originally out of a quest to make a bag valve mask uh, resuscitator smaller. So, and then our, our focus in time has evolved and has morphed to something that we think is a more important problem that we're trying to solve. But the company got its start in a NICU in Indianapolis. I was talking with an emergency medicine resident colleague of mine, and she said, you know, as doctors, we know how to save people's lives, but whenever, uh, you know, but if we're walking our dog at the park and somebody hits the ground, uh, we are not really much better at saving somebody's life than the next person. Which is which is true, you know. Uh, mouth to mouth resuscitation is no longer encouraged, and I would say in a COVID world, it's it, it is discouraged. People are very unlikely to go and be putting their mouths on on, on strangers uh, this time. So if somebody needs air uh, and you are not in a clinical setting, what are you going to do for them? You know, and that was what kind of initiated the the, the mission to make a compact bag valve mask. And again, that's why we're called compact medical solutions because that was our whole focus. And so we spent years trying to design a bag valve mask that would be super slim. Uh, you could have it uh, in AED boxes, for example. So, you know, defibrillators that you find uh, in most public spaces in America that provides great cardiac support, but there's nothing for lung support in, in those. Uh, so could you, could you design a bag valve mask so small that you could fit it inside a traditional AED box? And now you have heart and lung support all in one place. You know, that was, that was our focus. And then over, over time, actually it was, it was about this time last year, as we were looking at our prototype uh, that had been handed to us, we realized that the prototype actually, this, this design actually solves another problem and that is hyperventilation. So traditional bag valve masks are great, uh, but they have not changed a lot since the original bag valve mask was invented in 1957. If you look at pictures of the original Ambu bag and the bag valve mask you can purchase today, they, they look pretty similar. They're, they're overall the same, uh, the same concept that it's always been. And uh, the Butterfly BVM radically departs from, from the traditional concept of what a bag valve mask should look like and, and, uh, and, and a little bit of how it functions. And that makes it possible for us to prevent hyperventilation. So hyperventilation is when you give somebody too much air. And it might, you might think, well, how bad could that be? This person isn't breathing. So how bad could it be if I give them a little bit, little bit extra air? There's a lot of evidence that actually it, it can be very harmful. Uh, lung tissue, when it gets stretched, uh, it, can, it causes cellular damage uh, that in some cases is permanent. And, uh, and there's, there's evidence that if you, um, for example, they did a, a study in animals in pigs where they, they took a group of pigs that were, uh, they simulated cardiac arrest. And then uh, one group was hyperventilated. They were given two to three times the amount of air that is recommended. And the other group was not. The group that was hyperventilated, the, the mortality rate was 86% in that group. Whereas the group that was not hyperventilated, the, the, mort the mortality rate was 14%. So it does seem that hyperventilation makes, uh, makes a difference and, uh, and can kill people. And the other thing about it is we know that it happens all the time. Uh, we don't have, you know, nobody runs around with video cameras and films paramedics uh, as they're doing their work. So it's hard to pin down exactly how often hyperventilation happens. But in the controlled studies, at least in the literature that we have seen, uh, where they have filmed lifesavers performing lifesaving in hospital settings and ambulance settings and the like, in all of those studies, hyperventilation happened between 80 to 100% of the time that lifesavers were giving people too much air. And the reason this happens is because traditional bag valve masks instantly inflate. So the moment that you're not squeezing the bag, it reinflates almost instantaneously. And so that leads lifesavers to instinctively squeeze the bag again and again, and inappropriately gives two people too much air. And I, and I am a lifesaver. And I, and, and, and I can tell you that when you're in the heat of the moment, your adrenaline's going if you are not very conscientious of, of counting and, 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 and checking the, you know, making sure that, that, uh, that you're counting the number of seconds that you're supposed to between breaths, it is, it is easy to, to inadvertently give somebody too much air. 
it, it, it's not, it happens all the time. Uh, and, and, and really that is not a human failing. That is a, that is a, an equipment failing. That's not, it's not people that need to be fixed, you know, with this because we've tried, right. I, I, every time I go for, for recertification in my, you know, advanced life support, uh, recertification, we talked about hyperventilation and, and making sure that the rate is, is appropriate. So we, we've tried to train the humans to do it better, but we're still human and we're going to, we're going to mess up on it. So what we really need is, is some way f- for the equipment to be, to prevent that. And that's, that's what the butterfly BBM, uh, is, is what we are designing the butterfly BBM to be able to do. Awesome. How has, I, I guess there's a couple of places I want to take this one. I'd, I'd be super interested in how COVID has, it, if it has affected kind of your go-to-market strategy and the process that you're taking and, Two, I also wanted to talk about the process of taking a medical device to market because it I, I will ad, admit a little bit of ignorance there that that's not where I have a ton of experience. So and I don't know which one of those makes sense to tackle first. So maybe I'll let you pick if it makes sense to talk through the process in general and then maybe how that might have changed recently uh, or if it makes more sense to talk a little bit about current events. Sure. So to let's go to the the COVID question first. So COVID-19 has not really changed a whole lot for compact medical solutions in terms of our day-to-day operations. We're a very small, very lean comp- company. And, and, and so it hasn't really changed a lot for us from that standpoint. Uh, and I would say it hasn't really changed our timeline for development and product launch either, just because of the stage of development where we happen to be at the moment. If we were much further along, yes, then, then you know, our manufacturing could be disrupted. We could be waiting on parts to ship from different you know, different parts of the country. And that could be complicated. Uh, but we're just because of where we happen to be in our stage of development, we, it, it hasn't affected us as much right now. So that, that part has been good. What COVID has done is it's really helped to underscore why what we're working on is important. Like I said, mouth to mouth resuscitation, uh, is, is even less in favor if it ever was in favor, uh, today, uh, than before because of communicable diseases like COVID-19 in a typical year. The other thing, uh, another another reason is because in a typical year, there are about 3 million emergent intubations in the United States. And each one of those is an opportunity for somebody to be hyperventilated where damage, where they could be injured or they could even be killed. And that's in a typical year. In a year with COVID-19, the number of emergent intubations has gone up significantly. There are some hospitals in the U.S. where they are doing two to three times the number of emergent intubations than what they normally would do. It, it just means that there's that many more instances where hyperventilation could be happening and where people could be harmed. And so, again, that just stresses why what we're working on is important. And then there's a situation a few weeks ago in one of the hospitals in Indianapolis that I, I happen to know uh, that the last ventilator that that hospital had on standby for the babies in their neonatal intensive care unit uh, was removed in order to provide care for adults who are battling COVID-19. Uh, and, and to be clear, they, they didn't take a baby off of a ventilator. It's just they had a ventilator on standby to be used and and somebody came in who needed it uh, because and ventilators are tight because of COVID-19. And so there was a window of a few hours where that neonatal intensive care unit didn't have a ventilator on, on standby in case a baby came along who needed it. And you might ask, well, what, do you, what can you do in that situation if you have a baby who needs a ventilator, but you don't have one? The answer is there's only one thing you can do, and that is you have to provide manual ventilation with something like a bag valve mask. But because traditional bag valve masks don't adequately prevent hyperventilation, they're really not ideal for that sort of application. Again, it just really helps to underscore why what we're working on is, is important. So COVID uh, has, been, has been stressful for everybody, including for Compact Medical Solutions. But if anything, it's given us that much more wind in our sails to say this matters and we've really got really to work on, on getting this out. And then what does the process look like to take a device like this to to market. So walk me through from kind of just at a high level, you have this idea, it's a it's a thing you want to do to you're able to sell this to a hospital. What what does that look like? Yeah, there are so many hoops uh when you're trying to get a medical device to market. Yeah, uh, if I <laughs> in the future, I may uh I may work on something that doesn't have quite as much regulation and uh 
and uh, hopes to yeah, jump. Yeah, this is the scared straight part of the episode. You're allowed to uh, <laughs> convince anybody who thinks they want to do what you're doing to do something else. <laughs> oh, man. I tell you, I, I have – when we did our G-Beta program, I have to admit, I, I looked – uh, I glanced aside at, at, at some of our, our my colleagues in, in, in our cohort who were doing uh, software companies, and with a little bit of jealousy sometimes because it's uh, I, they have their own challenges, right? And, and I know you're you're a software guy, and, and, and by no means is any startup easy. Um, but being able to take a product, you know, write it, code it, and then you know start start going out there and you know and, and starting to look for customers. Uh, is, is, is just really cool to be able to do that. With medical devices, you have, yeah, especially when we're talking about a tangible product, any tangible product, right? You have, to, uh, you have to prove the concept. You have to prove that it actually can be done within the laws of physics uh, is, is, is one thing you have to do. Um, you have to find people who can do the prototyping, who can build it. And then with regulation, we have, uh, we have the FDA. I don't look at the FDA as an enemy at all. They are, I think the FDA is a partner. They are the, the regulations that exist are there for a reason. And, um, and they can actually guide the process of bringing a, your, your product to market and it can make it, make it a better product in the long run. And so, but there is just the reality that you can't start selling your, your medical device until you have FDA clearance, right? That, that's just the reality. And that takes time. It adds time to your, to your, you know, getting to market and, and the like. So there are there are just some challenges that that come from that. So, uh, so yeah, so you have to get somebody to build it. You have to set up your manufacturing. You have to have uh, your 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 device has to be close enough to what it's actually going to be uh, sold as uh, in order to conduct the testing that needs to be done on it in order to secure FDA approval. So there's just there's a lot of hoops that have, you have to jump through. And then when it comes to FDA, there's different pathways you can pursue. And I'll be quick to say I'm not an expert in the FDA, but just, uh, you know, we, we've had lots of conversations with people who are experts and we're being guided by uh, by consultants who are, are experts in the FDA. But any medical device, you, you know, you, you, you have you have a few different options for getting it approved. Um, there is, you know, pre-market clearance where you have to, you know, you're starting from scratch. Uh, this is a device that has never been seen before, and you have to uh, you have to do clinical trials on it. Safety data, everything has to be has to be done, and that can be very expensive and add a lot of time to to getting to market. And then there's something called the 510K pathway, which is FDA fast tracking. And that was uh, fast tracking is it's an idea where if you can show that there is a predicate device out there that is similar enough to what you are doing, it doesn't mean it's exactly the same, but it's similar enough. And that device that you're similar enough to is well established. It's it's known, you know, its risks and benefits are known. Then it is possible for the FDA to approve your device by saying that it's substantially equivalent to what's already out there. And that's how actually how most you know bag valve masks today they're all basically to to my understanding they're all basically approved on the 510k pathway because you know a new bag valve mask comes out and you're able to show that it's substantially equivalent to what's already out there. So, and the nice thing about being able to do fast tracking is the timeline. Once you submit your application, your timeline to, to approval is about six months. So it's it's a much faster process. Clinical trials usually are not required for a 510k uh, and the like. So, uh, so there's some real benefits to it, and we are optimistic that the Butterfly BVM would be able to be approved on the 510k pathway, uh, which again simplifies the amount of time it's going to take to get to market. And cuts down on the resources it's going to take to get there. Now there is something also. There's something called a de novo pathway, which is somewhere in between the two. Um, and again, I'm not an expert on it, but that's uh, so I, I won't go into that. But just say that there are other pathways than than those two. Um, but the one that we think is going to be the best option for us is probably going to be the 510k pathway. So that's that's what we're looking at. And while while we're talking about 510k pathways, everything the different options for for getting approval, I do want to say here just to be clear that it's probably obvious, but we have not secured FDA approval, and so you know we're we're trying to be very careful not to make any claims about what the product uh, can do at this point. Uh, but if I if I have or have inadvertently made any claims here, just just to be clear. None of these claims have been validated by the FDA at this point. We're confident in our strategy. We're, we're confident that someday we will be able to secure approval on, on these things. But to be clear, we have not secured FDA approval on, on this device yet. Got it. So now let's fast forward to the future. You've gotten FDA approval. You're allowed to sell this product. 
how are you currently planning on doing that? Is this the type of product that you would sell through distributors? Is this the kind of thing you would try to go direct to sell? How, what does that look like for a product like this? Yeah. Once we've secured approval, we are looking at doing a six-month pilot launch of the of the device. And we've got... There's, there's uh, three U.S. cities that we're currently considering. Uh, Indianapolis is one of those where we have some good, strong contacts where we would work with um, so some local hospital and, and emergency medical services groups to, uh, to do a pilot launch of the Butterfly BVM. And that will help us to start generating the one is the market data and, and user data. How did people like it? Did they hate it? Is there something we should change about it? Uh, but also to start generating hopefully some safety data to, to be able to compare the Butterfly BVM to traditional bag valve masks that are out there. Uh, and then from, from there, once that's done, we're looking at doing uh, an aggressive nationwide launch of the product. There are different options. We could set up our own uh, you know, sales team and, uh, and try and hammer out contracts with hospitals and, and EMS services across the country, that will be very expensive and very labor intensive. So we are probably not going to go with that option. But then, you know, the, the flip side of that is to is to work with a very large uh, distributor. And we're not sure if that will work the best for us either. Uh, there are some distributors that are very large and that are, you know, the, the largest in the country. But we're not we're not confident that because we are a single product medical device company, we're not sure if we get a whole lot of attention from them. And so what we're thinking right now is more to find more of a sweet spot somewhere between the two where we can find kind of a small to midsize uh, supplier who would be able to, to easily fit, integrate what we're doing into what they already offer and, and try and use, use that route to promote the product and to help with distribution. Got it. So, John, do you have any swag for Compact Medical Solutions yet? Do you and the team have any swag, or have you been giving swag out as part of your customer discovery process? Uh, do, you, do you want the honest answer? No. <laughs> yeah, I want the honest answer. No, we haven't yet, and that's because we have been we have been very capital efficient. We've done everything that we've done so far on uh, eighty five thousand dollars, and so we've been very very careful on what we spend on. Uh, but we do know that swag is in our future and it's something that at some point we're going to, going to have to, to jump in with, yeah. In the, in the medical profession, what is the swag of choice? <sighs> to be honest with you, the ones that I like the best are, are t-shirts. Okay, I see, I thought you were gonna say like the pen or something like that, something boring, but going with, going with the t-shirt, I like it. The, as I, I, you know, if I go to a conference, I'll be totally honest with you. Like everybody's got pens and they've got little, you know, first aid kits. And although they now, they, you know, some people hand out little bottles of hand sanitizer with their logo on it. Those would be worth something now. Uh, <laughs> I would, I would keep those, but to be honest with you, most of the stuff is kind of cheap and I don't end up really using it. But one thing that I do always use is a, is a good t-shirt, especially if it's like, if it's made out of a, like a nice material and it feels feels good and it looks good on you um that's that's something that i will use uh, for years to come so well right on when you and the team are ready to go get your compact medical solutions t-shirts you can do that at fuel merchandise group fuel merchandise is a full service promotional products company specializing in branded merchandise and apparel and if you check them out online at fuelmerchandise.com mention startup competitors you can get 10 percent off your first order when you guys are ready to roll out your own t-shirts cool Fuel, that's F-U-E-L merchandise. Uh, F-U-E-L merchandise.com. That's right. Cool. All right. We'll check them out. I would love to hear a little bit more about the G beta process, particularly for uh, for a company like yours as opposed to a software company. So we've talked to a couple of folks who've gone through G beta generator, some other like Techstars accelerator programs. I would love to hear your experience going through G beta, what worked for you, what maybe didn't. Uh, is there anything you're able to share there? Sure. Yeah. Uh... I will say quickly, I love G-Beta. I, I like have a massive soft spot in my heart for G-Beta uh, that I will carry with me to the day I die. I, I, it, was such a, it was such a great thing for our company. What a great endorsement. That's awesome. Honestly, like I, and I, like, no, I trust me, nobody's paying me to say that. Like, I just, I, I, I really just love G-Beta. And uh, I just, I love, love the, our, our G-Beta team here that we worked with in Indianapolis are just phenomenal. We had Chelsea and Jeff and Cole and Alexa were, were just awesome. They were so good. And, 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 and just, we, we really, really loved working with them. 
So no, we, we, we very much appreciated G beta and, and everything they did for us. And honestly, I'll, I'll be honest with you, it was a little bit of a, of a whim uh, <laughs> when we, when we signed up for it. So I had learned about G beta. It was only, I think two days before the applications were due. Uh, I was at a, at a meeting at Indiana university and somebody said, you know, we really like G beta. We like it when startups do G beta. And I said, well, I need to look into this. I did. And Thankfully, I did when I did because it was it was I, I think it was two days before the applications were you know were closing and so we went ahead and submitted our application and then uh, the process uh, is you go and you make kind of an early pitch and then they they select five companies from the the companies that pitched to them to be part of their their next cohort and so we did that and we got in and then you you start a seven week process uh, it's it's really a boot camp uh, where they 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 walk you through. Portions of it are, are um, lectures where they teach you what does a term sheet look like, what does uh, you know, what does your due diligence uh, folder need to have in it. Let's talk about patents. Let's talk about uh, fundraising. All, all these different elements that you so you get an education in those things. Uh, but then what's great about G Beta um, and that I think I, I don't think every accelerator is like this is because they 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 only take five companies per cohort. They are able to really focus on the the five that they have and so you get one to two sometimes more meetings every week that are one-on-one with just your company and the g beta leadership working through your executive summary and 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 working through your pitch and working through the next and so you just get a a great deal of of one-on-one quality uh advice and and attention which i don't know that i don't know that every accelerator is structured that way so it's uh, it, it's it's pretty it's pretty remarkable and 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 then it's really fun. It, by the end, you know, the very last uh, last part of it, you go, you have your G beta pitch night where you get to stand up on stage. And I think we had, I don't remember, I think it was 150 plus people at at, at this event get to get up and, and do your pitch. Uh, we got a lot of excitement and, and and positive responses from that. And and to contrast how much we had grown from our very first pitch to G beta from where we were on pitch night, I mean it was just the the, the amount of growth was just phenomenal. So that was uh, that was fun. And then and then the very last week of G beta is is kind of your investor week where they just do you know it's like speed dating, just rapid you know one investor after the next you're you're meeting with and and uh, and so that was just it was just a fun experience and I think that was what really helped us to grow and transform the most as a as a company. Now, um, you know, you had asked about what are the the things that worked and, and didn't. So, you know, the one thing is that we were one of only a few companies working on a tangible product, and we were one of one of two that were working on a medical device. And and that's not out of five because our particular cohort, we actually had 10. So there was an ag- agriculture cohort and then a, a, an all, all tech co- cohort. And that was, uh, so we had five from each of them. Most of the companies, I think in, in, in G beta, at least here in Indianapolis are software companies. And, uh, and so I think it had a little bit more of a SaaS or software flavor to it. Um, most of the mentors I think that we worked with had, were coming out of a software background and, and honestly, most of the investors I think we worked with were looking for software companies. And so um, that was, I, I think, a little bit of a, of a challenge. Uh, there wasn't maybe as many mentors who had worked on tangible products or, or certainly medical devices, though we did have some. But what I will say is that there is a entrepreneurship is to a certain extent, entrepreneurship is entrepreneurship. And, and, and there are things that you learn, uh, whether you're doing a software company or a medical device company or a... Uh, you know, services company or whatever, you name it, there are some elements of, of being an entrepreneur that cross over to all of those disciplines. So we still got a tremendous amount of mileage out of it, even though Indianapolis itself, I think, has, has a pretty heavy software focus. Awesome. I, I appreciate you walking through that. I think I remember you are a practicing physician still, correct? That's correct. Yes. And you're taking a new medical device to market and you're involved, you were at, at one period involved in G-Beta. So I, and my impression of G-Beta was it was a bit of a full-time job. <laughs> how, how did you juggle all of that? I, I would be super curious to, to learn that. And I have four children and uh, yeah. It, it, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it was a lot to juggle. Uh, yes, I do practice. I, I, I'm only part-time as a clinician. Uh, so I work, I work part-time as a pediatric hospitalist. And then I also work part-time for Indiana University doing 
uh, medical device development in general that's not affiliated or not not connected directly to Compact Medical Solutions. So I have a few different hats that I wear. Yes, G-Beta is a bit of a full-time job, uh, but it wasn't just me doing it. Adam Scott is our chief technical officer for Compact Medical Solutions. And Adam was my partner through that entire experience and just... Uh, and, and just did a marvelous job uh, helping to helping to make that work. There were some companies that that had just one founder uh, there for the whole experience, and I I, I think that that was uh, would, would have been honestly for me it probably would have been impossible just with all the all the different things that that are going on. Uh, but yeah, I, I was not alone in that experience. Adam Scott uh, was was there with me the whole time, and uh, and he 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 helped make it all work. So yeah, uh, huge huge shout out to Adam. He's he's fantastic and uh and is uh the best partner i've i've, I've well i've only had <laughs> one startup quite like this he's been he's been the best partner that i've that i've worked with uh ever on on a project like this so that's awesome as you reflect on just the so zoom out of g g beta if, as you reflect on the entire process from when you thought you would go down this path and do this what has been the most challenging part so far there have been you know it's one mountain after another. It's one hurdle after another that you have to cross. You have to have to get over. You know, I think the the biggest hurdle and the hardest thing is is the uh, there's an emotional toll to being a an entrepreneur. And I think um, having the vision and having the persistence that's required uh, is is important. And and sometimes some days are harder than others. I spoke with one entrepreneur, a uh, su- very successful entrepreneur. Uh, this is. A long time ago, it was over a year ago, and he warned me. He said, "You know, one thing about being an entrepreneur is that it's the roller coaster ride, and it's the you have to fight emotions on both sides of the spectrum." He said, "There are some days that you are going to think, man, this is the I am working on the coolest thing that has ever been done in the history of this planet, and uh, it's <laughs> so successful. Everybody's going to love it. They're going to line up and buy it. It's going to change the world. Uh, you know, here we go." And you so say there's this euphoria that you have to fight some days. And then there are other days where you are going to think, this is, I can't believe I'm wasting my time with this. Like, this is never going to go anywhere. This is never going to succeed. No one's ever going to buy it. You know, <laughs> this, uh, you know, it, it, you have, and, and, and his point was that both of those can be misleading, they, but they're, they're both wrong. And the, the truth is, is somewhere in the middle, right? <laughs> yes, you got to believe in what you're doing and, you know, but don't get so carried away and, and to where you can't see that there are some ways that your process or your product could still be improved and can be made better. Uh, don't be blinded by success. Uh, but at the same time, don't be so discouraged by setbacks and hurdles that you hit. Uh, that you, you know, that you can't keep pushing forward uh, towards, towards, you know, the goal towards the finish line. So uh, that emotional toll can be really, can be really hard. I think we hit a snag this particular week. I say snag. I mean, this week, like I told you, we, we, we got to pitch to a couple of different investment groups and we were going to the next round of discussions with both of them. Uh, we felt just tremendous uh, uh, excitement about all of that. But then we also have gotten some news this week of some, some setbacks on things that we're, that we're working through. And so, yeah, with, and, and actually that all happened within uh, about six hours of each other where it was like, yes, this is awesome. Here we go. And then like, oh shoot, are you serious? I thought we had already solved that problem and now it's come back to us, you know? So, um, all of that, like I said, that was like within a six hour window. So yeah, there's, um, there is a, uh, there's a roller coaster to it and, and being able to push through, uh, that has been, I think the hardest thing about this whole process is just. Uh, is just you know keeping keeping your emotions somewhere in the middle and, and being able to push forward. So I, I'm gonna I'll ask the question and I'm gonna talk a little bit to give you time to think. So the question is gonna be: Do you have strategies and tactics for how you do that? That, that are like specific things that you that you've trained or practiced or can be you know very specific or or more general. And the thing that's really interesting to me talking to you, since you're a physician, is and I imagine there's very high highs there and very low lows there as well. Is do you find that that has translated into the entrepreneurial life where you're leveraging some of those skills for how to maintain kind of that even you know outlook even through those? Uh, so a- anyway, so hopefully that's given you enough time to process and think through how you might answer that. But I'd be very interested to know how you do that. What are some of the tools and techniques that that you do to to keep 
kind of that constant outlook and and where you think you develop those skills. Yeah, absolutely. So to borrow an analogy, um, I am not an investor, but uh, you know, someday I hope to be. But um, I've heard it said uh, that you you want to diversify your portfolio, right? So you never put all of your investment eggs or dollars into one thing, right? So that if if one thing falls through, uh, you're, you're not you know duped, right? You have you have diversified. You've got other other irons in the fire, other 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 possible things that could still produce for you and and and, and carry you through. And uh, I think you have to do the same thing in life. You you have to diversify the portfolio of the things that matter to you the most in life. And and for me, Compact Medical Solutions, I am incredibly passionate about it. I love it. I'm cutting my hours at my at my day job in order to make more time for it and uh, and and yeah I, I, I'm so excited for this company and for for what's happening the traction we're getting and where we're going and I'm so excited to someday I hope release a bag valve mass that is going to completely disrupt the industry and uh, and just change the way resuscitation is done for the future going forward and save I I don't you know hopefully we'll save many lives, you know, I, and I, I, so I, I'm, I'm incredibly excited and passionate about it, but, uh, but I will say that compact medical solutions is not the only, uh, thing for me. And to be clear, like, what are the other things that, that matter to me? I mean, the other ones for me are faith and family that, that matter tremendously. You have to diversify your focus on, on, and, and make sure that you're not so focused on, on one thing that if that falls through you're you've lost all hope and, and you're, you're going to quit and throw up the towel, if that makes sense. I think we, I've seen this sometimes in medicine. So becoming a doctor is a very long process and it's a very competitive process. And I've seen, I've seen some of my colleagues over the years who are so focused on, I've got to get into medical school. Okay. Now I've got to get, you know, perfect grades in medical school. Okay. Now I've got to get into this residency. Now I've got to go to this fellowship. Now I've got to go to the most prestigious program in the country. I've got to, you know, push and push and push as hard as I can because my whole focus is I need to be the most, you know, successful clinician in this highly specialized field and at this most prestigious institution. And, and I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to criticize people who do that because I, we need people who do that. But, but the danger in doing that is what do you do when you get there and, and success um, isn't what you thought it was going to be. Or if something happens along the way that suddenly that dream is dashed and, and, and you can no longer do it, uh, what do you have to fall back on? And if, if the whole, long, whole way along the road, you've, you've sacrificed family and relationships and, and your faith and your health, exercising and other things, if you sacrifice all of those things along the way, what do you have to fall back on? You know, I, I, I mentioned I have four children. I once... <laughs> I once said that to an entrepreneur, um, and he said to me, "Sorry, the, I don't know if you want this in the in the podcast." Oh, I totally want this. You're going to finish oh that gosh. sentence. Oh my gosh! Okay, I don't know if you want. <laughs> I don't want to offend anybody, but I once I once spoke to a, an entrepreneur, and I and I mentioned that I had four children, and he said, "That's your problem, right there." Really? Yeah. He said, "That's." He's like, "That's why you don't. Have, that's why you, you know you can't succeed." Oh uh, man! And it's dead wrong. Yeah, it makes it harder. It's more complicated. Um, literally I can hear my kids screaming out (laughs) outside the door here and and it makes things more challenging, but they, you know, they're what keeps it going. You know, this week when we got, we got some bad news, a a bit of a setback, it's like, you know, my, that's what keeps me going. I, my, my youngest daughter has down syndrome. Uh, her name's Ella. Uh, she's 16 months old and she's amazing. But, uh, Ella is, I have to tell you, she's the sweetest thing in the world. She can put a smile on anybody's face. I, I, I say it all the time, but Ella's the best Prozac in the world. <laughs> you know, if I'm having a really hard day. All I have to do is hold Ella when she's calm and she's, you know, when she's relaxed a little bit. If I just hold her for a few minutes, like it just like turbocharges you. You're just like, you know what? It's not so bad. I can keep moving. I can keep going. So, um, so yeah. So, um, what keeps you going on the hard days uh, as a, for me anyway, as an entrepreneur, it's, it's diversifying my life. It's, it's finding time for, for God, for my faith, for, for continuing to go to church. Uh, I I'm, I'm, I'm also a Bishop in my church. It's a volunteer call that, that has come to me. So I'm busy with that too. Of course uh, you are. 
Uh, so um, it's it's uh, but so that that requires some of my attention and service. But I tell you, it just being able to serve other people, being able to you know take time for family, take time for God, take time for yourself, get out there and exercise, and and uh, and have other other goals and things you're working on are what can help you to get through the hard times. And I want to be clear, it doesn't mean I'm not focused on compact medical solutions. It doesn't mean I'm not doing everything I can to, uh, to, to make this company successful. And I'm, I'm deeply committed to every one of our investors to, to doing everything I can to bring a, a nice return back to them. But, uh, but man, if, I, if all I had was compact medical solutions, it would be this. this I, I don't know that I could do it. I'm so glad I asked that question. <laughs> thank, thank you for that. Yeah. Uh, all right. I think uh, I we're a little bit over time, and and I don't know where I could even go from there. That was uh, that was a beautiful answer. So, Jonathan, if folks want to get in touch with you, or if they want to learn more about Compact Medical Solutions, what's the best way for them to do that? Yeah, absolutely. The best way to reach us, feel free to email me at John. That's J O N at Compact Medical Solutions dot com. And uh, otherwise, they're welcome to go to our website, www.compactmedicalsolutions.com. Uh, there's, there's information on there as well. Awesome. Perfect. Thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, love hearing the story and best of luck. All right. Thanks so much, Mike. Appreciate it. If you're thinking of launching a SaaS product, startup competitors can provide data on your closest competitors, survey potential users, or provide other product validation services. Learn more at startupcompetitors.com.